Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are very pleased and very proud this year to welcome uh, an esteemed guest, Andre Villager, a show developer and producer of high impact headline grabbing events. Um, just to name a few, ladies and gentlemen, uh, his credits include the Beijing opening ceremony, the Beijing Olympic opening ceremony, uh, sensational product launches for the likes of Mercedes-Benz as well, and also uh, 15,000 people attendee gala extravaganza for new skin in Dubai. Uh, folks, he is a world expert on live entertainment. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me in giving uh, him a very warm welcome to the stage right now, Mr. Andre Villager. So, good afternoon, everybody. So, my presentation today is called Creating Masterpieces. Sounds pretty good. So, doesn't it? Okay, the music, please stop it. Okay, but how are masterpieces created? In my opinion, it deals with a complete picture of concept creation from technical execution lighting, sound, media, to communication of the workflow of the individual departments. These are important issues to me, the blending of all stages, departments, to from, to from something completely unique. Although I have mentioned the various departments, I want to discuss, you, but discuss with you how I work. Go, okay. Workflow is the very important point for me. A project is a process where you always have to stay flexible. An important element is keeping the windows of possibilities open. For that to happen, the various departments have to grasp a good understanding of how they are linking together in an intellectual way. An important factor for the quality of a show and a course, of course, for the budget. This is why communication is an important factor for a successful workflow. Today I will show an example of two very meaningful productions. So one of the first events that changed my life was the opening ceremony in 2008 Olympic Games in China. And the second, the New Year Eve show, I created as a director in Dubai, I created directed in Dubai Burj Khalifa, the world's tallest tower. That was two years ago. Okay. Go ahead. So, maybe I should tell you a little bit about myself before, start, before people start wondering who is that guy. So, my name is Andre Valdega and I'm a very curious person. So, always be curious. But what exactly do I do? I couldn't give you a title or a job description for it. Agencies in the event industry call me a media artist, show creator and show developer. My technical directors, or the technical directors, media production people, and 3D designers often call me a perfectionist. My assistant calls me a pain in the behind. That's it, right? Okay. So, and I consider myself a traveler who feels at home in Russia, US, China, the Emirates, Asia, and Europe. I'm not concerned about my job title, but I care very much about what I do. The easiest way to explain it is to show you a small sample of my work to give you a better idea of what I do. So please watch this short trailer, the video please.
show for the future. So I hope the video gave an impression of my work, but what have I done to get to this point? Let me give you a brief look out, a, a brief look about myself. My roots are actually in the music industry. I was self-educated composer and sound engineer. So I had a big studio, so Technic was a part of my daily life. But at some point I realized that visual inspired me more than musical notes. Sorry for that. So, so my roots, oh. I saw pictures in my mind's eye. I became more interested in the visuals and started creating and producing corporate events. I put all of my energy into developing new picture worlds. There was a particular artist who triggered my creative work. So in 1997, media magician Marco Tempus gave me a push and confirmed what I was thinking. It inspired me to see him push a simple ping pong ball into a screen. I knew that it was fake, but my brain discovered a perceptional magic moment. It was the birth of my fundamental idea of interaction between images and people and the idea of melting this together. I searched for technical innovation and studied human perception, and I recognized that our brain is a very, very amazing big tool. That took me out of music and gave me a new affinity for picture magic and made my curiosity a motor for new ideas. In 2004, I developed this innovative show form. So let's have a watch, let's watch for this short video. So that was 11 years ago, but the one interesting fact about this film, it brought me to the Olympic Games in China. So through set designer Mark Fisher, who designed for Pink Floyd, U2, Rolling Stones, Cirque du Soleil, and who unfortunately passed away, my film found its way to Zhang Yimou, the director of the Olympic Games, who requested a meeting with me. So as you can see in this picture, very emotional for me right now, so I didn't let this unique opportunity slip away. Here's Mark, Zhang Yimou, and myself in Beijing, one day after the opening ceremony, at the end of an unbelievable experience. Here are a few details during my time as a creative director for the opening ceremony. How did it all start? My first meeting with Zhang Yimou happened at midnight. It was my first time in China. So, and he asked to see some initial results 12 hours later. So that meant a fast and furious creation time for me. Unbelievable fast. It wasn't, I wasn't expecting that kind of creative pressure. 
It was a hard brainstorming test, which I passed. I guess they felt I could offer a different perspective they wanted. Zhang Yimou especially told me that I was an inspiring person to, for him. That felt really good to hear. A stay of five days was planned. It became nine months of totally different life. So I quickly became a part of a large Chinese creative team. I was the only one, the only Western guy in the uh, Chinese creative team. Here are some of them. And this was all done, however, without speaking Chinese. And none of the Chinese 3D designers spoke English. That's very complicated. Although I was given a translator, it still wasn't easy. I became involved in all the faces a storyboard developer and idea giver for the entire opening show from the beginning on. Today I want to focus on two parts on the, uh, of the opening ceremony. This is, if you saw the opening ceremony, I think you will have noticed the countdown. The idea of the countdown and the show opener was naturally a theme from the beginning on. In China, you have to learn to go about things differently. Decisions are not made in a small group and then executed. It was a never-ending story. And so we discussed the opening until shortly before showtime. Since the different opening ideas seemed too complicated, our team looked for a simpler solution. So we decided to view the, the, to view the drummers from above to get a new perspective, as you see here. And then it went click in me. Each drum pad in front of the drummers could re represent a pixel, because we had 2,008 of them. So simple, easy, impressive. So we conceived the pixel drummers. By simply turning lights on and off, we created pictures, words and numbers, developing a pixel field of digital drummers. Here's what the idea looked like. But how did the countdown appear to run and move smoothly? Very easy. The simplest solution was human control. The pixels were controlled using the most basic type of activation, a hand-triggering switch for 2008 drummers. In-ear metronome was used. Each drummer controlled his own light pixel that gave that gave, by the way, us intelligent pixels. There was no programming of the illuminated objects. Let me show you. Here's the countdown in pixels. Video, please. That was the show opener, very impressive. Of course, there were many other show elements and scenes to do. Let's, take, let's have a look at the original storyboard, the first ideas and what the different parts and 3D renderings looked like. So if you can see over there, no, over there. So there is the Silk Road, Silk Road was one idea. A sail would come up from the Silk Road. Another idea was a dynasty scene. So, but the palace, the palace scene was too complicated. The Great Wall was another idea. It would have been a gigantic puppet show, but it was replaced. You might recognize the Confucius scene here. So, we thought about a scroll scene with dancers interactively writing on the scroll. This was done. That was a little bit about the storyboard, but now I would like to concentrate on the Tai Chi idea we used, a more complex scene. A long projection wall of movable ghosts, elements formed a circle, which has great significance in China in terms of Tai Chi. And please, the video. With the requirement for a circle, I set myself the task of creating a very large projection ring in the stadium, where scenes and images could be shown on at 360 degrees, filling the stadium while playing with steps and motion. I knew that controlled by live performers was the only way to make this temporary moving, uh, the temporary moving object work. So, sorry, that's the wrong one. This one, yes. Through this, I became a bridge between the creative and the technical departments. I wanted to understand the mechanics and join more and more technical meetings. So it was important to me to hear what people said in person. 
a direct exchange instead of learning from third parties that quickly made me a liaison between the creative and the technical teams. Here my technical understanding was important. The video, please. So, to begin with, I focused on the goals wall. You see it in the stadium right now, the, the, the big sphere is under construction. I focused on the goals wall. The question was how to use it, how to move it and use it in the scene. Take a look. These are our first rehearsal with in the screen, so I made it with my own camera that looks not that good. So, please, the next video. You know what? We made an interesting discovery that, as simple as it looks, but a small person could not raise a six meters walled panel. The next video, please. That's the wrong one. This one, yes. So raise it. You see, it's a little bit difficult. So at least we need two persons on the left and the right side. And next. A second. Next. No, that's the wrong one. It's backwards. Sorry, no, the picture. This one, thank you very much. Based on this, we shortened the panels to four meters. In addition to sizing the ghost frames, we had to set the number of performers, the number of ghost panels and the number of rings, and the right materials so the ghosts would have the right transparency. Now we start with concept work and sketch it in the virtual space. The video, please. Here is one of the early animations. As you can see, this one it has five circles, so that didn't work. We wanted to be multidimensional. The field that was very important for projecting on two old inner and outer rings. I knew through experience from other projects that projecting onto two screens with one beamer would not disturb the depth of focus. That's a technical thing, but it's very important to know. Of course, you will lose some sharpness, because, but because of the distance from the audience, that was not a concern. Next one. Okay. It became clear that we would use 26 performers. Today it's not very much, but uh, it, yeah, 2008 was a lot of because we had 140 at the end. Projectors for the, for the on-field tide shearing with the triple layers and another 75 projectors for the upper stadium ring projection. Because of different distances, we need to pay particular attention applying different lenses. So, and you see this catch, that's very clever, gives a good idea of how cleverly the projection was set up. Projection area, areas were divided into fields so we could project onto three layers with just one beamer. That's very clever. So, of course, it's also good for the budget. But the first box representing the inner circle and the second box is the second layer for the Tai Chi master. She is interacting with the video. And the third box for the outer screen positions. As you can see, the apparently simple theme of a ring structure became more and more complicated and it actually kept us busy for about three months. And of course, another major question was how to make this temporary projection construction stand inside the stadium. We also had to clarify the transition from the human bird's nest to the Tai Chi show part that was really complicated because 720 performers with screens run from one position while other performers, 2008, run from the, from the bird's nest are running out all within 30 seconds. There was only one solution, of course, rehearsal under the most realistic conditions, especially high location was used as a mock-up of the stadium. And so here we rehearsed and experimented with the performers. This is what it looked like. Please, the video. Okay, that was a time lapse, it wasn't a real temple. So, that was the rehearsal, and here, look at the opening ceremony. Video, please.
Throughout the Olympics, I again saw the complexity of interplay between departments and the need to guide people in thinking universally with a large scale production. The quality of understanding and communication will complete the effect of creating such big shows. So I would like to use this as a kickoff for the next project. Here's a project which provides an even more in-depth illustration of workflow. So my colleague, Mr. Alex Burgos, will present this to you. So, hello. Hello. Good afternoon. So, as uh, Andre just explained, my name is Alex Burgos, and uh, I'm a choreographer and stage director and creative developer working together with Andre from, well, the very beginning, for over 24 years. Okay, New Year's Eve show, 2013, at the world's tallest building in Dubai, the Burj Khalifa. How did this mega project come about? Well, first we had a briefing and a call for bids. An agency approached us with an assignment from the Imar company, a real estate, a leading real estate company in the United Arab Emirates. And briefly put, this involved presenting an 18 minute show before the grand firework finale. What was the client's request for the presentation in our pitch? What you see is what you get. And the second requirement was to present something never seen before. I mean, this was literally written inside the tender. And what they also told us is that money was not an object. Money's not an object. Very good. The first challenge that we face, and um, that was the actual size of the Burj Khalifa itself, the, the, the vast area we had to cover and turn into a whole show production area. Here's a bird's eye view of the area. And as you can see, Andre has taken a picture standing 650 feet above the, uh, 650 meters, excuse me, above ground. And you'll notice that the lakes below, with scattered islands all around, they provided for us a challenge because for audience to actually view our production would be quite challenging because they would never have one point of view. They would be viewing from different areas and it wouldn't be as if it would be in a conventional theater. Um, people as well as the islands are scattered around. And as a result, we had to take precise planning and become and make sure that um, to present this show in a way that everybody would witness it in an identical fashion. So our immediate requirement was no cheap seats. The next question concerned the areas and the buildings and the basic structures around and how we were going to implement this using the area that we have. It was important to understand the buildings and the areas and what we can turn into a media space and presentation field. Um, of course, we're very visual, as you have already seen through quite a few videos. And so we wanted to actually display projection onto the Burj Khalifa itself, which in itself posed a bit of a challenge because the Burj Khalifa is mostly made out of glass. And how do you project onto glass? It's not as hard as you might think. We just have to make sure that the glass planes are completely dirty and that would not be a problem. But that was too risky for us, so we dumped that idea. But for this reason, we created or we had an idea of setting multi-size projection screens distributed throughout the 350 meter by 150 meter location. I mean, we had various screens. We had island screens, they were 30 meters by 25 meters. We had stair screens that were close to the shopping malls and we had video mapping projection on the shopping malls itself and to the adjoining buildings. And what we also had is a 230 meter by 14 meter main screen in front of the actual Burj Khalifa. And that started to make the whole area, as far as, as far as the media production is concerned, a bit rounder. In this picture, though, you can see that our next challenge would be the lake. This is a, an impressive man-made lake around the Burj Khalifa, but it made it hard and difficult for us, uh, for the audience, to have a clear viewpoint um, because, because of the fact that the distances were too great. Um, the show would have, uh, would have appeared completely scattered and viewers would have felt somewhat lost in the show. So this brought us to another idea. We, we decided to take 
interactive satellite stages. We took stages and we immersed them throughout the lake and positioned them in the water and designed for performers to play with images that sync with all the other screens together. And this was a good way to create a basis for an overall look of art because the water screens gave us complete visual unity. And they provided a close-up experience for the audience, which became a type of anchor, so to speak. And, and that held the, the overall look and the structure together. And it was our goal from the outset to incorporate the entire area as a media installation that would actually affect and have an emotional impact on everyone within the audience. Um, we naturally wanted to include the water fountain. The Burj Khalifa has an amazing water fountain show that goes on, but we needed to take that water fountain and we, we needed to use it to our advantage and choreograph it the way we needed to have it done. And this meant that we had to actually find out what patterns would be possible and which ones wouldn't. We worked closely in collaboration with Wet Design, and that's a, a Las Vegas-based company responsible for the Daily Fountain Show in front of the Burj Khalifa. So that was our setup, okay? Um, very technical, yes. Which is quite ironic because Andre and I are both very creative. Um, we're not technical, but we see more and more as, as time goes on and looking further into the future that technique and, and creation are really starting to blend together. But the next thing I wanted to share with you is the actual storytelling part um, that helped us to win this pitch for the Burj Khalifa. So the slogan at the, mo at the time was the center of now, a concept that we based our story on. And for us, this slogan represented an image, an image of something that rotates in large circles and around the tower and something that is sent out from the tower in and into the world and comes back. So we came up with an idea of a ball of energy um, that would actually pull in positive energy itself. And it would travel around the world collecting gifts and smiles from every person all over the continent and then come back from its journey full of positive international energy, which it unloads at the tower on this special New Year's night. And these are a few sketches from the idea of our ball of energy traveling, being born out of the sand, taking its journey into the world with a special greeting. It flies around the world, as you can see here, and travels on until the ball of energy makes its way back to the Burj Khalifa, full of gifts and bursting with positive emotion. Here it discharges all of its energy and releases the spectacle. And from the pinnacle of the tower, along the tower, into the surrounding area. And what we realized when we got to this point is, although we might have a, a great story, what you've seen are, are just sketches. And would these sketches actually have any kind of impact whatsoever? No, they wouldn't. They were just sketches. They were lifeless. And we wanted to actually bring life to the actual pitch itself. I mean, if you consider what we had in mind, or at least what we knew we had in our mind, would you have understood the depth and the impact of the show? Could you have imagined a performance of the multitude that we were expecting to, to bring about? Um, we would never have gotten this bid or this contract if we had simply shown sketches and drawings. So we regrouped and we took a new approach. And um, from this point onward, we focused on the actual essence of the briefing, what I told you that was written inside the tender itself. What you see is what you get. So we thought, OK, good. No more sketches, requiring any kind of explanation or feats of imagination from the audience that could possibly raise questions Well, what happens between each scene. We don't, we don't understand. We simply want the client to see the show and to know exactly what we mean without our guidance. I mean, but the client's marketing department, they need a strong tool to present to the chairman. So we decided to visualize our concept through video mapping on panoramic photos in the form of film 
that would present the entire show from a variety of vantage points. So we wanted to create a virtual image of the show and place it in the real world, so to speak. So in order to do this, we went to Dubai. We took plenty of pictures of the surrounding area. And um, we had to actually, each photo had to be precisely defined. Um, afterwards, it would be possible to correctly embed the virtual camera angles and, and create the right perspective for mapping the show. And we had a pretty good idea already of the perspective that we wanted. Um, in some places, it was necessary to actually go into houses, private apartments, to take pictures from the positions that we needed it, and also to get access into places that were not accessible to the, to the public. But this allowed us to capture the reality of the area in pictures. What we did is we also used GPS data to keep records of the pictures taken to map the show in video format. And a positive side effect of this were that additional perspectives were included in the live broadcast feed. And we worked with 15,000 pixels per picture. I mean, we were in high definition. Um, and I've taken enough time talking about the process, and that was the actual technical jargon of everything. But um, let's have a quick look at what our film looked like. Video, please. A new dawn rises. An energy calls us. Welcome to the center of now. A dance born out of the sand. A rising spirit. Feel its call across the oceans, uniting us all. Join the journey. Watch it grow. Feel its flow.
Happy New Year. <laughs> so, um, like I said, what you've actually just seen is, is only a pitch. It's only a pitch film. And um, it's very interesting because, I mean, I pay attention to detail in the things that I do performance-wise. But Andre is a complete stickler about detail. And, and because a lot of people believe, from having, from having just seen this film alone, that this was the actual show. And it wasn't. It was just a, it was just a pitch film. Um, but what you've just seen uh, has been about 60,000 euros spent on only the film itself. And it took about four weeks production time and roughly 20 people to work on it. Do we always have this kind of budget? No. <laughs> But when we do, we take advantage of it. Um, and the most important thing about it is that with this film and with all the work behind it, we were able to actually win the pitch and we got the job and that felt very good. Um, but once the euphoria of winning the pitch fades and what comes next is always not a very nice day for us and uh, for myself, for Andre, for the agencies and for the technical companies because that's the day when we find out what the actual budget is. Anyway, whatever. So anyway, another, another thing to, to, that made this uh, a very successful project is collaboration, collaboration and communication, something that Andre had already discussed before, because we had to bring an international department together to start the production. And the, the idea of dealing with a multi-international production crew is, is quite massive, because we had an Australian lighting designer, we had a Las Vegas-based fountain operator, German technical director, an English composer, French fire effects, uh, musicians from the Czech Republic, English composer, New York-based choreographer, um, performers from Dubai, and they were all within their own countries before we actually started production. And we only had six weeks to get this show up and, and on its feet. So how were we able to do that? Were we going to use sketches and calls and Skype? Yes, that would have been possible. Would that have been effective? No, that would have wasted a lot of time. So what we came up with is the idea of a time plan. Um, a, a, a timeline, and this timeline is, is, is a special timeline that keeps everything plain and simple, and from my point of view, the most effective communication tool. Um, this timeline is a timeline where, well, we call the timeline, Andre had given it the name of the Holy Master Timeline, the com communication tool that clearly presents the complex relationships within the show, and it can be used by all the departments and is based on a simple timeline. Video, please. This is an example of what our timeline looked like for the uh, New Year's Eve show. All the components were integrated exactly in this timeline. And for example, the color world could be viewed by the lighting designer who could pre-program. And departments um, can see what effects would ha were going to happen when and which department was doing what and what was the outcome and how were things progressing or how were things in delay we could actually make adjustments by just using this simple modus. And it provided a high degree of reliability. So next. Can you stop the video, please? Thank you. So um, you've heard a, a bundle of information, but here is an outtake of the finished product. Video, please.
So that was it. Um, thank you. One last point is um, considering what the future will look like as far as the entertainment industry goes and for us dealing with interactivity. As you can see, it's been a great deal of what we do um, with pictures and with performance and using a whole bunch of technology. And where are we actually heading? Um, our techniques and, and, and the production of virtual worlds becoming an even more elaborate, even more elaborate than they already are? Yes, we believe that they are. We're also convinced that the work process involved are changing at a fundamental rate. Up until now, we've lacked an interdisciplinary base upon which things can be interconnected, inter intellectually inter interconnected and created. And an intellectual or smart, so to speak, merging of creation and technique, where creation and, and the physics are already fused from the beginning on, starting with the original idea. A stage in the future for us is a transformation and becomes the object of emotional content. And the content has a physical presence right where we want it to be. Uh, a combining link with two worlds can complement, yeah, with music as well, two worlds can complement each other in ways that they've never considered. And redefining a creative picture world in the never seen before business. Um, a set design implemented within a performance can actually start to extend outwards and, and space and content can be present or disappear. With new technology, we create a completely new spacious picture world in a dynamic new way and technique starts to blend and the idea of images uh, uh, becomes a vivid object. And because of this, we are starting to develop something we call the art tech. And the art tech is a team or an interdisciplinary team operating in a big scope and a big picture with a greater range of understanding of the arts and science, physics, technology, human performance, etc. It's a creative lab, so to speak. And our goal is to take technology to a whole new level of, of evolution, forming intelligent pixel kinetic that will become a mind-blowing experience for spectators in the future. Um, if I can, I just want to give you an example of a project we started last year that breaks quite a few limits, but is right in sync with our mindset for a show of the future. We call it Balance. It's what we're calling it for now. And Balance is the story of the best place in the universe. And for us, that would be Earth. And in Balance, the audience becomes a part of the production. Melissa mentioned earlier immersion. And we want to immerse the public and have them on board, so to speak, like astronauts orbiting the cosmos. And I'll show you here a few basic renderings to give you an impression. Video, please. So this is an idea of what we have for balance. Um, it's not a small project, and we're, we're talking about taking a theater and, 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 and building a, a theater in a transformative way, a transformative theater, in which all surfaces are movable, and so perspective and space are completely redefined. We can also define how weightlessness, for example, can be, can be sensed and how perception of up and down should or could be experienced. And the use of black contours and curves means that space itself is unlimited and we create an endless depth. And here, as you can see, for us, it's important to simulate the, the Earth rotation. And kinetics will have new ways of, of interacting with actual performers and actually with themselves. And we were talking about using it in a way to, to create new movement, not just up and down, side to side, spiraling, and, and uh, uh, using this as a means to transport our story. And we have an idea of, uh, of, of using this transformative space and turning it into an, an orchestra, or an orchestra that actually moves towards the audience and, and takes on an entirely new dynamic. It's, we call it a sliding orchestra. We also have the idea of creating 500 drones and, and simulating the Big Bang Theory and, and the creation of the universe. And we can, divine, we can um, define curvature of time with lasers, for example. And stages can be placed at our discretion to create new performance spaces for actors, dancers, performers. And here you'll also notice we have an idea for holographic projection surfaces and, and movable LED robotic surfaces, which allow images to wander through space and time. It's an idea. Okay, so just briefly, our motivation, what has that actually been? We, we do all these shows and we're thinking about the future and what is the motivation? Because actually, if you, if you see what you've just seen and you look at it and you think, okay, well, nice, but 
It's never going to be possible. We're never, ever going to get the funding for it. And our frame of mind has always been, then let's start. Let's do it. Why not? Because working on, on impossible ideas and the mo is, for us, the most interesting and challenging thing in the world, and it's actually a lot of fun. I'll give you another small example of a completely new show creation. And here's an idea of our forward thinking and how technology meshed with creation and performance could look on a completely new level. Video, please. So here we have moving objects. I mean, you've seen and you can tell through our videos that we do a lot of interaction with video and film. That's all great, but we want to take that a step further. We want to take objects and have them move through space and actually be three-dimensional objects that can interact with performers and we can actually use it as a tool. This isn't an installation. This is a form of communication and through shows. And here we also have, for example, a set design that is not just a simple set design, but we can actually use to our advantage to create a completely new world by just using movable objects with LEDs and a person. It's exciting stuff, and uh, we're looking forward to moving on and creating the future. Um, so we've spoken a lot about technology this and, and technology that, but these are of course only tools that we use to awaken within you, within not just you, but everybody else out there, the audience. Because an important factor for any show that we've ever created, and for most shows in general, and the whole entertainment industry, is the emotion. We want to touch your emotion by the things that you see, the things that you, that you sense and you feel, you, know, you can smell. Um, this is the selling point of each unique and outstanding entertainment show. And, and through this and the added live human performance, this, this is what will affect us all. And because of this, we feel a need to continue breaking boundaries and familiar patterns of thought and, and create new experiences of delight. As Andre said in the beginning, questioning and curiosity, these are creative motors. And to be very honest, the, the most beautiful moment in creating or a creative thinking process is when your vision truly comes to light. I mean, that's... That's actually why we do it, because we really enjoy it and we have fun and the end product is for us the great thing to see. And the only thing better than that is knowing that you're the first person to have had the idea. It's actually nice too. So, thank you very much for your attention, your time. I hope to um, speak to a few of you and get to know you over the next couple of days. Thank you very much.